The Arab-speaking countries of the world are a bit of a mystery to people from many different regions, and in this video we're going to discuss Arab countries, history, and people, which I feel is important especially as the world spotlight seems to increasingly shine on this large section of the globe. As most people know, there are many different Arab-speaking countries on the planet today in an area known as the Arab world, and if you take the time to learn about them, you'll find that they're anything but homogenous, with each having certain characteristics that make them unique. The Arab world is by no means synonymous with terms such as the Islamic world or the Middle East, although many might use the labels interchangeably, but the Arab world is divided between the portions in Southwest Asia and in North Africa, with almost all Arab areas falling under the supranational organization known as the Arab League, although just who is considered an Arab is debatable among various groups. The core area of the Arab world, where the Arabic language was believed to have originated from, was around the area of the modern-day country of Saudi Arabia, although the current expanse of Arab influence has gone far beyond those original confines, with the Asiatic part of the Arab world having many essential nations such as Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, and many more. The additional nations of the Arab world were added to the Arabian homeland through a series of conquest and assimilation over thousands of years with the Arab invasions of Egypt and North Africa beginning in the 7th century AD. Because the Arab world is so expansive with many isolated regions and pockets, whether the term Arab can be accurately used to describe a catch-all ethnicity is debatable, especially considering that the Arabic language has numerous regional dialects with the increasing rate of globalization having partially closed the gap in recent years, although the area of the Maghreb, including Algeria and Morocco, have had a strong revivalist movement of its original Berber culture, a people group distantly related to, but definitely distinct from modern Arabs as we've discussed in a previous video. Many wonder why the Arab countries are divided between so many separate political entities with the largest Arab country, Egypt, only containing about a fourth of the Arab population, with there also being many large Arab enclaves in neighboring non-Arab countries, such as the large Arab community of Hayday province in southern Turkey, or more famously Khuzestan province in Iran on the border with Iraq, which was one of the catalysts for the first Gulf War. Now, the Arab world is not exactly comparable to a country such as France or Germany, or even China, which is similar in that it has a very large area and population with many wildly varying dialects. However, the political landscape of the Arab world has always been hectic and often violent. The Arab world has been influenced by several different external civilizations in the past few thousand years, including the Persians, Greeks, Romans, Mongols, Ottomans, and most recently, various European empires. During the 50 years between the 1940s and 90s, the Arab world was predominantly under the influence of three main ideologies, Arab nationalism, Marxism and socialism, and Islamic nationalism, also known as Islamism, with the 1990s marking a new era of foreign influence and interventionism headed by the Americans and Russians. Arab nationalism was largely seen as a way to combat the earlier waves of foreign occupation of the Arab world, either by the Ottomans, the British, or the French, as Arab leaders wished to use their identity as Arab-speaking Muslims as a rallying cry against the invaders. However, many of the areas had diverged for so long that they had already formed their own regional identities, sometimes having multiple identities within one nation. For instance, in Egypt, the north of the country is inhabited by standard Egyptian Arabic speakers. However, along the upper Nile, the population of 20 million is considered to be Saidi Arabs, who have a separate dialect and culture. I guarantee you anyone from the Arab world above the age of 30 would instantly recognize this man, Gamal Abdel Nasser, former president of Egypt and one of the most prominent figures in Arab history and pan-Arab nationalism. Born in 1918, while Egypt and Sudan were still a protectorate of the UK, Nasser envisioned a pan-Arab state stretching from the Arabian Sea to the Atlantic Ocean, encompassing the entirety of the Arabian Peninsula, the Levant, Egypt, Sudan, and the Maghreb. 100 years later, and unfortunately the region seems just as divided as ever, however not without several movements since then to fulfill the dream of pan-Arabism, such as the union between Egypt and Sudan under the United Kingdom from 1899 to 1956, the union between Transjordan and the British Mandate of Palestine between 1920 and 1923, 
The short-lived Arab Federation between Iraq and Jordan in 1958, the United Arab Republic, a union between 1958 and 1971 between Egypt and Syria that was probably the longest lasting, although other Arab states briefly joined during this period as well, such as North Yemen until 1961 when the union was known as the United Arab States, and Libya between 1972 and 1977 when it was known as the Federation of Arab Republics. All of these attempts at ethnic nationalism and irredentism were very fleeting and tenuous, with migration between the linked nations being limited and political integration being strained at best. However, there were many examples of pan-Arabism in the real world that were actually successful in resulting in stable Arab unification, that being the unifying of Saudi Arabia in 1932 between the Kingdom of Hejaz and Sultanate of Nej, the unifying of the United Arab Emirates over a span of nearly two centuries starting in 1708 between Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and countless others, and most recently the merger between the Shia North Yemen and Sunni South Yemen in 1990, although the recent Yemeni civil war does call into question whether integration has been a complete success. Various splits based on religion, culture, and political polarization have all hampered further movements for Arab Federation, and relations between many Arab nations have become rather hostile in recent years, and certain areas of the Arab world are starting to dis distance themselves from pan-Arab politics in favor of local unions such as the Arab Maghreb Union. There are also huge minorities of non-Arabs that live in the area traditionally considered the Arab world. There are around 34 million people of Amazigh or Berber descent in the Maghreb, although the vast majority of Maghrebi Arabs also have significant genetic and cultural influence from the indigenous group. It's estimated that descendants of Ottoman Turks and the Levant in North Africa number in the millions with up to 23 million people with at least partial Turkish origin, especially in northern Iraq and Syria, where they're known respectively as Iraqi and Syrian Turkomen, and in the Maghreb where they're known as Kologlis. Kurdish minorities in northern Iraq and Syria number around 12 million in the two countries, and they're actually an Iranian ethnic group more closely related to Persians, as we discussed in a recent video. There are many Christian minorities in the area, such as Arab Christians of the Levant, known as Melkites, Syriac Christians from Iraq and Syria, including Assyrians, Aramaeans, and Chaldeans, a surprisingly large number of Armenians who fled to the region after the genocide of 1915, and the Coptic Christians of Egypt, who make up a fairly large minority in the country. Because of the Arab world's proximity to Sub-Saharan Africa, countries like Sudan and Mauritania have a large amount of African admixture, and in Yemen, East African descendants known as al Akdam make up 5-10%, to 10 with smaller numbers of Africans in Iraq and Gulf countries that had been brought there hundreds of years ago. By far the most recent and fastest growing minority, although using the term minority to describe them is a bit inaccurate, are the conglomerate of South Asian immigrants from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh. In many Gulf countries such as the UAE and Qatar, South Asians have already made up a plurality of the population, and since most are simply temporary or construction workers, this has resulted in a very lopsided sex ratio for these countries. Although any major Arab amalgamation is very unlikely to occur within our lifetimes, if the Arab League were to merge into one country, it would without a doubt be one of the most influential nations on earth. With a population of almost 400 million people as of 2017, Arabia would be the third largest country on earth, being around 20% larger than the population of the United States, with its area being 3.8 million square miles, or second on earth after Russia, which makes it just a hair larger than Canada, and similar to those two countries, the populations are largely concentrated in certain areas and large swaths of land are completely uninhabited, that being Siberia for Russia and the Sahara Desert for the Arab region, with Arabia being divided between the continents of Africa and Asia. The country would have an impressive GDP of $7.3 trillion, making it fourth in the world after China, the United States, and India, with the average citizen making around 20 k a year, which is fairly modest when compared to the Western world, but would be considered an economic giant when it comes to Africa and Asia. And as you could probably guess, there's a huge disparity between rich and poor, with there currently being 38 Arab billionaires living in the region, which is about the same as the country of Canada or France. There are also substantial 
substantial numbers of ethnic Arabs in the global diaspora, with there being around 8 million in Europe, mostly in Western European countries like France, Germany, and the Benelux countries, although most Arabs in Europe are Maghrebi from Algeria, Tunisia, or Morocco, and hence might not identify with other Arab groups. Arab Americans and Canadians number nearly 4 million, with the largest being Lebanese, Egyptian, and Syrian, with most Arab Americans being Christian rather than Muslim. Places like South and Southeast Asia, along with parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, have had large numbers of Arab traders migrate to those regions throughout the millennia, and Australia also has a small, much more recently established Arab community, but by far the largest group of Arabs outside of the homeland of any region would have to be Latin America, especially the southern cone of South America, that being southern Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. Arabs from the Ottoman Empire have been moving to the region for well over a hundred years and had largely integrated with whites of European origin in Latin American countries, and today around 10 million Latinos are confirmed to be Arabs, while up to 30 million, or 5%, are estimated to have at least some Arab ancestry. The many, many Arab people groups and nations form a unique landscape across the Middle East and North Africa, having one of the most interesting and outright zaniest histories of any group on the planet. The Arabs may currently be divided between nearly two dozen sovereign nations and countless religious divisions, but it would certainly be interesting to see what Nasser's dream of Arab political integration as a single sovereign country would look like in the modern world, even if the modern geopolitical landscape of the region would ensure that it would only ever be a pipe dream in reality. Go ahead and let me know your thoughts on the Arab people and countries, and what you think a mass Arab conglomerate would look like, and how it would function in the real world. By the way, a lot of people think that I'm an Arab of some kind, but that's actually not true, as I've mentioned before on occasion. I'm mostly German, with about one-fourth Iranian and one-fourth Black American, so I can understand why people would think I'm Middle Eastern of some kind. As always, thanks for watching, everyone. This has been Mason, and I'll see you next time.